All right, it's officially 1.20 on the East Coast, so I want to get this Ask Me Anything uh, session started. Uh, my name is Adrian Sampson, I'm from Cornell, and I am delighted to host uh, Professor Margaret martin -Nosi, who is a professor in the Computer Science Department at Princeton. I know her mostly as a computer architect, but as of February, she's also um, at the U.S. National Science Foundation, the assistant director that is the person in charge of SIZE, which is the Computer and Information Science and Engineering Directorate. Um, within the NSF. Uh, SIZE provides the majority of government funding to basic CS research in the US. Another fun title that Margaret has is an AD White Professor at Large at Cornell, which means that she's on the hook to come give talks uh, periodically, uh, sadly not during uh, social distancing, but this is like a, a very, uh, a, a, it's, a, it's an honor afforded to a select few, including the jazz musician Wynton Marcellus. It's um, right before me in alphabetical order in that list, which is like uh, super humbling for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure for him as well. Uh, I, uh, I have a lot of questions of my own, but I'm, I think they may be drowned out by the questions that we have already from Slack. So let's just dive into those. I want to um, start with Ali Donaldson from Imperial College London, whom everyone knows is the general chair of PLDI this year, who asks, I would love to hear a bit about your role at NSF. Being based in the UK, I only know roughly what the NSF is. I see it as analogous to our Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. So I don't have a specific question, but I'd love to know what the job involves and how you manage your time between your NSF role and your duties at Princeton. Um, sure. So I started at NSF in February. Uh, uh, the National Science Foundation in the US is was founded about 70 years ago. We just celebrated our birthday. Um, as the world came out of World War II, I think a lot of different countries were looking into what they could do to advance society in peacetime. And one of the answers that the US made was to start the National Science Foundation, um, which is a broad based um, across all sciences and very basic science focused agency. So where the US has the National Institutes of Health to focus on sort of human medicine, um, NSF is broad across all sciences. And then within that, the size directorate, computer and information science and engineering, um, was formed in 1986, just to acknowledge the degree to which computer science had become its own field over the years. Um, so the way NSF works is that the different topic areas, the different directorates, um, ha each have someone who leads that part, the assistant director for that topic area. And I'm the one for size, for computing. And um, those uh, ADs, as we call ourselves, typically rotate in from the research community. And the idea is that we bring with us our research experiences. We sort of come from having been funded by NSF, hop over the fence and then become an advocate for our field and the leader for the directorate with those experiences in mind. And so my predecessor, Jim Carosa, um, finished his four year term and is now um, back to his faculty position at UMass Amherst. Um, well, he's on sabbatical, but he will be going back to UMass Amherst. And so likewise, um, I intend to do a four-year term at NSF. And uh, while I am at NSF, I maintain my tenure at Princeton. Uh, the mix is challenging um, because the NSF job is uh, pretty much a full-time thing, being an advocate for the community, um, stewarding a billion dollar budget um, and figuring out how to spend it wisely across um, the full swath of important computing research opportunities. Um, but I continue to advise the PhD students that I have at Princeton um, and I'll advise them through graduation. I'm not admitting any new students right now. So that's kind of my time management scheme. And I, um, I, I would say this anyway, but especially since I suspect at least one or more of my postdocs is on listening to this, I will say that I've also benefited um, in terms of this transition from really wonderful postdocs who, and senior PhD students who have helped um, sort of share wisdom and, and keep uh, research going while I'm not able to focus on it 100%. Awesome, thanks. Um, I, th I think it'd be great to sort of flip over to the research side, although I don't mind coming back to NSF related topics in the future. Um, Tyler Sorensen from UC Santa Cruz, and also you might know him. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, asks, uh, I think some PO folks are a little intimidated about jumping into architecture research due to the steep learning curve of some of the tooling and infrastructure, e.g. big complicated simulators, FPGA tool flows, etc. 
Do you think this is a legitimate concern? And if so, what recent works or trends do you think are addressing this? Um, gosh, I, I think it's really important for the PL and the architecture people to work together. It's always been really important. If we, if we are together the hardware software interface, then it would be a shame if we didn't work together because we'd somehow leave the interface um, sort of untended and that would be a problem. So I think it's, it's, it's more important than ever. And I think different people bring different mindsets with them. Uh, so some people like Adrian sort of come from the sort of strongly PL side of it and bring those PL sensibilities and look at hardware problems and say, why are you guys doing it this way when you know we have different tools and techniques from the PL community we could do, we could bring to bear. Um, likewise, I think people from the architecture world are, are increasingly starting to look at some of the PL um, and full tool flow techniques and understand ways to rethink the interfaces, rethink the stacks in light of current trends. I mean, what I will often say is I feel like with Denard scaling and Moore's law either ending or slowing, um, and the sort of upswing and heterogeneous parallelism that we've seen, it's very clear that the old hardware software interface of an instruction set architecture that stays durable for 50 years, that is giving way to new hardware software interfaces and new tool flows that go all the way from very high level um, APIs, uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so forth, and drill down to circuits. And so we're gonna have to rethink some of these layers and that's gonna require that we bring in people from both sides. In terms of how to get started, I think the best way is to collaborate with someone from the other side uh, so that your strengths on one side are appreciated um, and complemented by someone from the quote unquote other side. Uh, and it also is a way to learn about the tools and the mindsets that people across the stack bring to these problems. Uh, I heartily endorse that collaboration thing. I think it's, it's, it's really, really hard to make progress otherwise. Um, I think that feeds nicely into another highly upvoted question from Slack. It's from Danny Yoga, also from Imperial College London that folks might know is the lead student volunteer for PLDI. It has been extremely, extremely helpful. Thank you, Dan. Uh, do you think that we will start to see applications that take full advantage of heterogeneous CPU FPGA systems in the future? And if that is the case, what programmability issues do you see there? Um, I, I think the only reason to not take advantage of CPU FPGA systems is the programmability issue, right? I mean, I think there are a lot of reasons to take advantage of them. Um, they offer the sort of specialization and, and customizability uh, without some of the challenges of sort of ASICs that are designed solely for one purpose. Um, but, but FPGAs have been hard to program for as long as anyone can remember. Um, possibly before some of the student volunteers were born, one of my early research projects was actually to do what was then sort of a big push from DARPA, US DARPA and elsewhere on configurable computing. And we looked at programmability of FPGA systems. This was in the late eighties. And um, the challenge then, sadly in many ways is reflected in some of the challenges we see now that too many FPGAs are closed architectures or at least some of the layers and tool flows are closed in ways that makes it hard for um, folks from the research community to innovate, add on them and build them together with other pieces. You kind of have to take, in many cases, you have to take what an FPGA vendor gives you as the tool flow or the programming environment. And that limits innovation, uh, which includes limiting the ability for CPUs and FPGAs to work together. Uh, so I think that where we can find ways to come up with more open interfaces or at least APIs that allow more uh, whatever, experimentation, that'll be a big help. The other thing about FPGAs that I will say is that traditional FPGAs that are sort of very fine-grained, sort of bit-level programmability, um, that traditional view is challenging because in many cases we're doing computations that um, don't need the, the, that fine of a grain of, of um, configurability. And in going to that fine grain configurability, we usually pay a cost in area, in power, or in clock rate. And, and so it's hard to win once you've paid those costs. Um, so 
where we can find more coarse grain configurability. I think there's more opportunities there for it being used as part of a sort of nimble specialization environment alongside a CPU um, for a wider range of applications. That's, That's cool. great. I, I might even uh, say that that granularity aspect even aspect even impacts the programmability because it increases the cost of like the place and route time because suddenly that's a lot more complex than it might need to be otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, okay, forgive me if this is this is a whiplash from zooming out so far so quickly, but I want to know the answer to this question too. It's from Michelle Strout at the University of Arizona who asks, "What is your approach to selecting research problems to work on?" Hi, Michelle. Uh, great question. Uh, I can, um, I don't know that I have an official approach. I'm just gonna name some. Um, I, I, I think at a high order bit, I'm extremely opportunistic. Um, and you can say that I suffer from you know, sort of insufficient attention span, um, but I've also found tremendous joy and fun and education in uh, trying out different things. So uh, let me give a few examples. Um, recently, my group has done a sequence of papers where we've looked at uh, formal specification and verification techniques to, initially it was to just verify a microarchitecture, a pipeline implementation against its ISA spec, but eventually we went up and down the stack. Where did that come from? That came from a graduate student of mine being extremely persuasive that this was an interesting topic, and that grad student um, uh, Dan Lustig is now at NVIDIA, continuing to work on this, and um, I give him full credit in dragging me into memory consistency models, which is a topic area that, frankly, I was scarred from, from grad school, and wasn't really eager to go anywhere near again after all the grad school discussions about consistency and relaxed consistency that, that I was a part of, um, but it's been great fun to come back into that, so that's an example of um, I think option number one, listen to your wise graduate students. Uh, option number two, um, I did a project called ZebraNet about 20 years ago, which was, um, I was a power efficient computing hardware kind of person. And one of my colleagues said, remind me to introduce you to Dan, remind me to tell you about zebras. That was the nature of the email. And uh, Dan was a colleague in biology who wanted to track zebras in Kenya. And um, he knew that I did power efficient hardware. And we started collaborating around the idea of building better power efficient GPS based devices to track wildlife in places that had um, very sparse communication connectivity. So GPS barely existed, cell, phones, cell phone coverage for the regions was poor. And so we came together. That was a collaboration that was um, a, a real stretch for both of us because I didn't know what biology research was like and he didn't know what was publishable on the computer system side. To him, figuring out how to waterproof the devices was as important as a novel communication protocol. And so it was hard for us to sort of educate that we can publish the novel communication protocol. We can't publish the glue or the waterproofing. And so we learned across these cultures. Um, and I think uh, it, was, it was a tremendous and educational project for all of us, partly because it, was a, it had a real deployment goal that we were all targeted at. And because um, we got to go to Kenya and, and put these devices on wildlife and watch them walk away, which is like, oh, um, I almost, I, I think I did cry when it when we first got the first data back from one of our callers. Uh, so so that was extraordinary, and that was very much of a opportunistic colleague kind of introduction, and me being open to doing something that seemed pretty weird at first, and yet we were able to frame it in terms of sensor networks and mobile computing and power efficiency, and show that it was very much in the wheelhouse of what we were doing anyway. Third one, if I might, is. I've also been doing about 12 years of work on the architecture and tool flow aspects of quantum computing. And that came from a third model for how to find topics, which is uh, if your department has a coffee pot and you are standing by the coffee pot often enough, you'll often have other colleagues who are standing by the coffee pot 
And um, out of one of those times, I started a conversation with one of my colleagues uh, who was very much from the semiconductor devices part of the world. He had an idea for a new kind of quantum computing um, device, a new kind of qubit. And he was able to portray it to me in a way where I could see the architecture aspects of it. And that started a, a collaboration and a co-advising that got me into the field. So I think in all these cases, it's a, a about willing to take a risk, um, but B about having a good sense for what looks interesting or impactful and C um, sort of being surrounded by smart, fun people that you want to talk with um, uh, because that always helps. And I think in today's world where we might not be surrounded by anyone, I'm in my spare bedroom in New Jersey right now. Um, I, I think the, the good side of this is we can still have those happenstance conversations by email, by Slack or whatever, and collaborate remotely. Thanks. Yeah, if we, if we work at it, we can. Um, here's a, here's a, a, a slightly different theme. This question is highly uploaded and I think is curious too. It's from Ben Zorn at Microsoft Research. Ben asks, what are your thoughts on the impact of preprint archives, such as archive, on the uh, quality, timeliness, and availability of computing research? Wow. Uh, so first of all, hi, Ben. It's very weird to be in this little world where there's, <laughs> there's only four Zoom windows. I can only see Adrian really. Um, and yet there's these people, wonderful colleagues that I know that are sort of out there in the world. But anyway, um, preprint archives. So that is a great question. I, I think there's two aspects to this. One is kind of how are we going to go forward with a sense of how we vet and peer review research in a world where everyone has the option to post things and um, get them known um, through a range of mechanisms. Um, I have I have the experience of um, putting things out on a preprint archive uh, in order to get the word out about something that we felt was important to get the word out about um, and watching the paper. So there was sort of a nuts and bolts announcement of something that we put on archive. And then there was a formal research paper related to that something that we put into a regular conference submission process. And um, the paper got rejected. Um, it actually got rejected twice. It got accepted on the third try. Um, but the preprint on archive uh, did get the word out in a timely way. And I'm very appreciative of the fact that it was there. Uh, and so I hope that we can figure out ways to navigate um, review quality and review timeliness in order to keep what is useful about the formal publication process, but not um, lose the timeliness and frankly, the wide audience of archive. Uh, I suspect that the papers I've put on archive get a broader readership across more topic areas than the ones um, that, sorry, ACM and PLDI, but the ones that quote unquote only go into one of our conferences because people have different habits about how they read. And increasingly, there are people who read by looking on archive and seeing what's new in their topic area. Um, so I have a feeling that's a growing phenomenon. And um, we should figure out how to integrate it into our review processes instead of hoping it will go away. That's Margaret speaking as Margaret. I don't know that NSF has a position on this. And I'm not speaking with my NSF hat when I say that. Makes sense. Um, so I wanted to make sure to ask you at least one quantum question, and we have one from Slack now. It's from Piyush Kushawa, Kush, Kushwaha from IIT Delhi, IIIT Delhi, sorry. Uh, there is a gap between the quantum computing research community's focus and the identification of where quantum computers are useful in areas such as chemistry. And in, in parentheses, he says, you mentioned this in Next Steps in Quantum Computing. Uh, do you think education, practitioners in other areas being able to understand the abilities of quantum computers is a major roadblock? And how might we address that? Uh, so that's a great question. So I, in talking about quantum, I will often talk about an algorithms to machine gap, which is to say that many people in the world have heard of Shor's algorithm or, or other algorithms that uh, show exponential speed ups uh, possible on the right quantum hardware. Um, but right now, the quantum hardware we can build 
has literally four to six orders of magnitude, uh, fewer resources than what those kinds of algorithms need uh, to be useful, to be um, sort of impactful practically. Uh, so then there are some modern algorithms that actually require fewer resources. Uh, the variational quantum eigensolver or VQE is an example of that. It's like, and QAOA is another example of a class of quantum algorithms that need fewer resources and therefore are um, viewed as possibly being useful on quantum machines earlier than things like Shor's. Um, and VQE is an example of something that can have value for chemistry, for molecular modeling of different types. Um, there's still a gap though. And so what are we gonna do to, to address that gap? Uh, one thing is uh, keep working on the hardware and plenty of people are. Another thing is to keep working on algorithms and see if just as we came up with VQE and QAOA, see if there are other algorithmic innovations that can help reduce the resource requirements further. And the third thing is um, to look at that gap and see whether there are ways that we can use tool flows to best exploit the resources we have. Um, but I agree with the questioner that a fourth thing across all of this is to get enough education up and down the stack um, that we have people who really can see enough of the big picture to find opportunities that we haven't found yet. Um, so one of the things that NSF um, has done is we launched a program called QCIS Faculty Fellows where CS departments in the US can apply for funding and get three years of bridge funding to hire someone who's interested in doing quantum within a CS department environment. And the idea is specifically to bring in these people who are willing to look at it holistically, to look at different parts of the stack. And also, as the questioner mentioned, to bring in a notion of curriculum innovation so that we have um, the right people looking at quantum curricular issues to train people for what's next. And um, there's actually been several announcements out of uh, US government funded workshops over the past month or two about the beginnings of some quantum education work. And I think there'll be more of that um, as we go. Thanks. Awesome, cool. So we have technically expended our 20 minute slot here, but I got a back channel message from Ellie. It says that we're okay to spill over a tiny bit. If you have time, can I ask you like one or possibly one and a half more questions before you sure. sign off? Okay, sure. great. Um, this this one I'm curious about is from Juby Taneja from, from University of Utah, who asks, what is your advice for PhD grad students to start involved with the NS NSF grant process? Are there any open workshops that we can attend to learn the process and writing skills? Uh, great question. I think so. The, the, the first way to get involved is to ask uh, your advisor um, if you can sort of peer into the next proposal that they write. I know I have certainly benefited from having students engaged in proposal writing processes myself. Um, they bring a sense of detail um, and they can, they're often sort of the best, uh, they have the best view of all the related work in the space and they can help figure out good ways to portray what's new about what we're proposing. Um, so for all those reasons, I think being there um, watching as your professor writes a proposal or offering to help with that uh, can be a, a big help. You'll at least see what they look like as they go. Um, the second thing is that um, the Computing Research Association or CRA offers career mentoring workshops. Um, there are CRA men career mentoring workshops every other February. And then there are CRA WP widening participation workshops um, every other February also, so that something is happening once a year. And those offer some insights on how to write proposals. And so um, that's a place where senior PhD students can definitely go for this kind of advice. And then once you are a faculty member, once you are a PI somewhere, uh, NSF and size run a range of different proposal writing workshops. We run one every year on the career proposals. Um, and we also run proposal writing workshops for other kinds of grants as well, because size, uh, our directorate wants people to be successful. And so helping people know how to write a proposal is a part of that. Thanks. Great. 
Um, there are many other great questions here that we, we absolutely can't do this all day, but I, um, I wanted to, to, to just give you a second, if you, if you have any like NSF related messages that you want to get out into the world, I wanted to, to give you the platform to do that. Is there any, anything uh, coming up that we should know about or that you want to talk about size related? Um, before I get into anything NSF related, uh, my colleague Dave Walker asked me, asked us to relay um, that SIG Plan Cares has a couple sessions during PLDI. Um, and uh, I'm no longer affiliated with SIG ARC Cares, but I, but I was. It was some of the most rewarding service I've ever done. So I, I hope that you will sort of um, find the SIG Plan Cares sessions. I think one is immediately after this, and one is uh, tomorrow at five in some time zone that I can't remember. Uh, so take a look for those because I, I think those are really useful places to look for support and to look for allies. Uh, NSF, um, we are encouraging people to do their career proposals earlier than you might be used to. Um, and we have data that shows actually if you do a career proposal soon after you land at a uni US university, um, those people have the same success rate as people who wait. Uh, so do it early so that you get the money to actually do the research while you're still an assistant professor instead of getting the career award money after you're tenured. <laughs> um, so I think there's a bunch of different announcements that are coming out, but in light of time, I will leave it there. And thanks a lot. This was a lot of fun. Could have gone on a lot longer. I appreciate um, PLDI doing this. It's great. Indeed. Um, thanks so much, Margaret. This was great. I really appreciate it. And there are other questions, especially ones that like tinge on the slight, slightly more technical that are in the Slack channel if you want, if you are curious to follow up with this. Yeah, I'll try. Yeah. Sweet. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone. I know.